So welcome back to the prologue of the HBC course. Um, we basically had the first part of this course hours today already explained a little bit what HPC is, um, what is the general frame of reference in the bigger computing domain, how we are different from high throughput computing, for instance, why basically hardware matters a lot for us, the kind of you know CPUs with high single thread performance or many cores, which are just thousands of, let's say, moderate core performance stick together to something we call a graphical processing unit. But the second part now is a little bit looking in all the detailed content of all the different lectures, but we kick that off actually also with some Q&A about the first part, could be about assignments, uh, anything. So I would raise the question here, maybe first in the room, a bit simpler, going from left to right, if there's any question. I will repeat the question for the online audience. So here was a question, the final projects, what it's about, what have people done before in this final projects, uh, how that could look like. The honest question, uh, answer to that is that we did do final projects before. <laughs> We're just starting this now because students' feedbacks and surveys, and we just talked a little bit outside with some students that confirms this, um, has changed the setup. So in the moment, we don't really have um, a very precise idea. We have already talked a little bit what could be ideas. And they're usually around, I would say, a small problem to tackle uh, where you use HPC in one respect. This could be an example that you think you have an AI problem to solve. And we will give you a list of things you can, of course, choose. But then also we would be open-minded if you have a project where you're working in or with your company where you maybe work beside, let's say, an AI company, whatever. We can maybe have then some AI code executed on different hardware and then basically observe a little bit the performance. That means maybe doing it badly, for instance, doing deep learning on a CPU, you will learn that's a no-go, and then doing deep learning on a GPU and see suddenly it's much quicker. We can do performance of you know parameter optimization checks where we change parameters of deep learning. This would be an AI project, for instance, with some data that is existing. Then for the physics part, that would be a small modeling. What we've done in the past were, for instance, assignments also about a fishery simulation. We could extend this now, where basically then wave propagation is in a fishing simulation, um, population of fish. Um, this would be one example where now we did a bigger assignment on it in the past, which could be also extend. But it's, of course, a toy problem. So we will look here and there also, can we maybe together with wind companies here in Iceland work to get some data there? and see how we can bring this into the simulation sciences. So um, long story short, we have not a very precise answer and no history track because we introduced this final project just now. We had always exams. But yeah, we try to basically then incorporate the feedback of students to, to work with this. And we are open-minded to get some suggestions from you, right? If your team already has an idea, uh, what could be maybe a project, we will discuss it both, Reza and me, and then we can get going. Important is that you start early with this. That's why we have to do this, I think, latest mid of February, if not start of February, to have this final project discussion. But my suggestion is also over the course hours now that coming in the next couple of weeks, you will see a little bit more what is now really HPC about, what is this parallel programming I'm talking about with MPI, for instance, or OpenMP. This will come. And then we, we basically go from there and we'll discuss it a little bit in the discussion session. We will have every now and then also Q&A sessions. It's not only lecture, 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 lecture. There will be quizzes and then a Q&A basically where we can also discuss these elements of final projects. But good question. Thank you very much. Any other question from the inline audience here in the room? Don't be shy. Yeah, please. So uh, there was a question, there was a three contacts, admittedly a lot, um, to basically get office hours, which means we can sit half an hour together, discuss a problem, assignment or something. The reason is that I'm very active, you will see that, and uh, I need an assistant. So Katrin is my assistant, so you should always include Morris and Katrin E, my assistant, for the first part of the course. When it's about CFD and the part that Reza will present, obviously I think it makes sense to have an office hour with him. 
I can talk about CFD as well. I did this in the past, but he is a real life expert doing it daily, right? So the best one to talk to. Hence, it depends a bit on the topic would be my answer. If it's generally HPC, this is, would be always Katrin and me. It's good that you always involve Katrin in the emails because she, you know, kicks my ass to answer emails as an assistant. That's her job. And then uh, if it's a CFD specific problem, um, then please use Razor. Good question. Thank you very much. Any other question from the in-house? Going once, twice. Okay, if that's not the case, let's move to the online audience. Is there any particular question we didn't really um, had covered? Okay, there's a question here from Michelangelo. Um, is there a difference between the class today and tomorrow or are two-day classes also mainly lectures and quizzes? Okay, good question. So um, we have basically the different modules to tackle, so that will be lecture by lecture by lecture. Um, some of these lectures will be practical lectures and we start tomorrow with a practical lecture where I will demonstrate you a couple of things like Unix, then we will learn a little bit about SSH, how to access systems of HPC. Then we basically next week will also think about scheduling and basically there will be a couple of lectures which are more theoretical in nature, in nature where I just talk or Razor will just talk and some of them where we do practical demonstrations. Um, then some of these lecture course hours that we will have, either it's on Monday or Tuesdays, will be for Q&A and a quiz or something like this. So basically there is, let's say, not a, a general difference between Monday and Tuesday. It will come with the flow. Usually um, the, we would say we will have this already in the modules, a little bit outlined so you know what to expect in the next, let's say, week. We will add this now also to the um, to the canvas. But it's something where you don't need necessarily preparation. If you need preparation, like a quiz, we will announce it early, right? So that you have a chance to prepare. We will also give the assignment one out very early that will come soon when we have a little bit more in understanding what MPI is, a message passing interface, but it takes you a little bit time to get there. So we will have one or two weeks now, um, just course hours where we talk some material and some practical demonstrations to get you up to speed. Usually it's like topics like Unix are not so well teached. Everybody has Unix access these days or who works with Unix daily. Okay, just maybe a small fraction of the room who has done C programming in the past. More and more people are in Java up to you. We have a very good fraction of C programming, very good. So these are things we just do a very brief introduction. You don't have to be experts for C programming in the course though. Um, we don't really want to do this and teach this. We have software engineering and programming and others that do this, Matthias Borg. Here's the idea of understanding parallel programming, right? This will be the main emphasis. So we don't do brilliant C codes. We rather do C codes that scale up a lot and be in parallel. And this requires a different type of thinking. Good, but well, thank you very much for the question. Any other question from the online audience? Um, or one that I overlooked, maybe. Okay, hey, Razor, you were not really here, okay, but yeah, you will introduce yourself in the next lecture then again. Okay, any other question from the online audience? Going once, twice. All right, so if that's not the case, let us continue a little bit. Um, now with some details. So we had a very 10,000 feet perspective introduction in the first part, what HPC is, uh, what we're doing in HPC. Now the idea is of course, uh, think a bit um, what we really do in all of these different lectures. This is a little bit flexible, will be augmented also with industry practice. So what I do here is let's give you a little bit of scope of each of the lectures. And then you will see alone for lecture one, I will give you a practical lecture one one where we really do high performance computing with SLURM and so on, with scheduling um, to really understand that you're not alone on these systems. You're actually there with many different users at the same time, concurrent access. Um, these are always shared and to understand this and so on will be a major idea basically of the first part that we have in lecture one, including some really practical topics. That means something like Unix, C programming, scheduling, so this will be augmented practical lectures around lecture one as well.
And the same goes for some other lectures where we do some more practical lectures left and right, which we don't capture here because they're really practical in nature, but then would be, for instance, including, you know, MPI programming that I show you how it works ready as a demonstration and not only a, tem a kind of theoretical uh, slide. But yeah, high performance computing will really start with an understanding also of the top 500 pro, um, list. It's something which is not obvious to you right now, but there's a big list in the world that captures really the supercomputers which have the most significant performance in the world. Um, and we will look at through this a little bit, how you come to this performance, what is basically the benchmark behind this. So lots of these kind of topics to get you into the field again, and then dive really in the different architectures that you have for modular supercomputing I already was explaining a little bit today. But this is idea of having different modules and you program these modules here and there a little bit differently. Here you see, for instance, the message passing interface that will be then also more in depth teached in the, let's say, lecture two, three, and so on, where we understand that we have not only one lifetime of a program, we have different life, basically times at the same time. Anybody looking dark actually on Netflix? Not now, okay, that is, would be a good idea to think about it. So you have basically lifetimes here and they interact with each other. Um, and we call that the message passing that we do from one process to another. And the other one that you see on top is a shared memory one. And to get the general understanding why we need that will be part of the first lecture. Then, as I said, with some practical augmentation, how and how to get access to HPC and so on, we will dive then in the details of the message passing interface, how we really do parallel processing on a machine. If you want to, for instance, broadcast one data element, from one processor and the memory space of the processor um, to all other processors in the node, for instance, or in a communicator more explicitly, as we call that in MPI. We will learn a little bit how to do this, what would be the practical um, operations that you do. We do call that collective operations, for instance, in MPI, where you tackle not only a send and receive, how you would think message passing works, also how one processor is actually targeting lots of other processors and how we do this on scale. This is again, of course, a point. Obviously in your assignment here and there, you will not go into thousands of thousands of processors, but the way how this is programmed is essentially like you can use thousands of thousands of processors very easily, right? So the scalability will be one part of the game again and again, why we basically need MPI. Otherwise we could all do a little bit shared memory optimization programming, but it doesn't scale up, right? Especially if you have lots of data sets and lots of crucial problems in science, uh, you always need more and more boxes and then you cannot access the memory anymore. Hence it's called distributed memory processing. You can't access the memory of the other processor. You have to explicitly send it around. That's a different to shared memory that we will allude to, but it's of course much more scalable but slower. Hence, you need the good interconnect between all the different nodes. And this has a huge, um, you know, background in terms of how you use different libraries for MPI, how you basically um, think more and more in parallel. It's also important to understand it's not only more a software engineering with Java and program something. So here we are having a, a kind of engineering or some domain problem to solve. So we have to crack it down in parallel problems, like for instance, weather forecast, right? And then solve the problem in parallel for each of the different domain parts. With this, we also try to share some bad code examples, whereas good examples. Some people come to the idea, for instance, in this picture of thinking, this could be easily done with a for loop, right? You say send and receive, send and receive, send and receive, and make a loop through all the processes. That's not how we program we would have MPI collectives for that. So these are all basically ideas where um, we have good and bad programming as well tackled. Then more and more you will see thinking in parallel, especially if you have a real problem to solve. You see here particle interactions, um, short range and long range particle interactions that are then summarized um, for the online audience, maybe again with a mouse pointy, sorry. So you see here a typical scientific problem with particle interactions, maybe stars that interact or so, um, and with short-term interactions that you compute in some way, and then you collect, let's say, the long-range interactions together as one to make the computing easier. This is a typical tree code mod, um, idea 
So the way how you crunch a domain into smaller problems will be part of lecture three, where the simplest you see probably there in an array from you know zero to 15, you would say, of course, we chunk it down into four pieces if we have four cores, and then we solve the problem in each of these different per core, and then later on, we basically have maybe the maximum or some aggregate, whatever it is, solved. But in many areas of science and engineering, that would be not scalable, um, depending also when you think the domain um, that we have again here in the long range interaction, um, when you chop it down into, let's say, a typical, you would say, a square kind of domain decomposition, then you see that one square has basically nothing to do, and two other squares have heavily something to do. So basically, it would be lots of load imbalance I'm talking about. Hence, the kind of way how you crunch a big problem into smaller pieces is not that trivial of always doing a grid like approach everything nice and shiny because it doesn't scale. So we will look into this a little bit and why we basically have this interesting blocky domains and why we need tree codes and why some other domains are just happy with the Cartesian grid as we call it. Um, this will be part of this. Understanding a little bit more what the parallelization really means if you have a real life problem. There's some small terms in theory to it to understand then really what is now the idea of you know performance in this regard, especially contradicted with serial performance, right? So what are now basically the limits also when we talk about that we can add basically um, to the serial part, a, a parallel part, and we put just more and more ends, more and more cores in, we will see it also has some limits. We cannot just have every problem jump down into more and more cores and then get better performance. There will be different laws uh, like Amdahl's law, we were looked into, uh, which basically limits our ability also to practically scale everything up. Lecture four is then on advanced MPI. You will see the first lecture on MPI will be a little bit of warm up, collectives, um, things like involving lots of cores. Now the advanced setup is much more. Now, how we map these ideas of this message exchanges to real practical problems, like for instance, the fishing again, as an example here. You would say you have the ocean as a Cartesian grid and the fish should always swim in different directions, right? The fish populations, how you basically compute that and organize this in your message exchanges over the big domain of the water. Then you, of course, have another fraction that you want to compute the wave propagation maybe of the water is different from the fish swimming. Then you would have a ship that is basically sailing on this. It would be also having a different direction, catching some fish. So the more you think about the details of all of these simulations, the more you will realize you need different communication paradigms, right, to work with each other. And this will be something what we will work there on in the first part. The second part will be then using MPI also for the data, because data is, of course, for us also very important, either for a kind of start. You need to have the initial wave height, maybe, or basically you want to have the initial fish population lots of things, but it also should be also parallel. So we talk about a parallel I.O. paradigm, which is an MPI existing, where you, if you want to maybe combine it a little bit, don't drop, um, let's say, every little file on every little different processor. You can imagine if you do this with 100,000 processors that we use, for instance, for a big problem, there would be lots of files created, which would be a big mess, and Unix would be quickly at the end with the inodes. So what we do is rather having, let's say, a parallel I.O. paradigm where we write all in one basically file, logically, right? And this is something what we will learn this parallel I.O. to make it scalable again. And there are data formats like the HDFF, which you basically should learn in NetCDF, which are really parallel file formats for that, where you basically write in parallel to one file. Yeah, and this will materialize in lecture four. Then in lecture five, uh, parallel programming with OpenMP, we share basically the idea of memory. And as we know, memory is basically something which is uh, of high performance, the best access you can have basically to data from a, let's say, access ratio perspective, not from the price perspective, memory is more expensive than of course, disks or even archives on tapes. Anyway, Lecture five captures the essence now of thinking a little bit more, what can we do within a node where every core can access the memory? It's called shared memory programming. And it's much more simpler in a way that you have, let's say, pragma statements we will learn with a sort of 
uh, de facto standard called OpenMP that is then basically uh, enabling us with some compiler directives to really um, provide simple statements to enable parallelism. You see a little bit here, the printf statement was a pragma OMP parallel statement, but this is also possible actually for basically simple loops. And we will learn a little bit about this, how you use an OpenMP within a node to really um, leverage the performance of the memory uh, with different building blocks that you use in parallel programming with OpenMP. Obviously, shared memory is extremely limited in the regard of being just basically, of course, um, possible to scale to every core that has access to memory. So usually people combine it with distributed memory where you then have to cr get across the different nodes to really scale up your performance to real life problems, to large scale problems, um, where you basically then have a so-called hybrid approach um, where you combine then actually MPI with distributed computing and distributed memory approaches using that across the nodes and then within the nodes you would do shared memory programming. But hybrid programming, we don't focus very much on it. It's a very advanced parallel programming concept with lots of errors on the way. Here we basically put an emphasis on different topics. Um, that's why we basically just provide you a simple introduction here to OpenMP to understand really what shared memory programming is. And then in lecture six, we shift the view a little bit to more, let's say, uh, advanced topics that are very popular right now, which basically is the idea of using GPUs. So this is a topic that has grown significantly in the last five years. Um, basically, we see um, an involving basically idea of using GPUs in different applications and also architecture differences in all the different Tesla architectures that come from NVIDIA, coming from you know K40s, K80s, Pascal, V100s, A100s. So there are lots of different ideas how you use GPUs today. And it's enormous pace how this technology has now basically advanced on the one hand and also find its way in really application areas um, that we basically have in HPC. So many different libraries are based now on CUDA using NVIDIA GPUs, while we also see now more recently actually also that AMD GPUs are actually coming to the forecast and basically um, really coming now to systems that we can actually use, which is quite nice for us. And in terms of having a bit more market or basically open market, so to speak, for GPUs and more is on the horizon of having even more hardware vendors entering in that game. So we will learn then basically in this lecture six a little bit how GPUs uh, not and generally um, basically advanced computing in terms of being very energy efficient uh, ways of processing. It basically has not a high single thread uh, CPU. It has much more processors which are let's say of moderate performance but the idea of a GPU is then having thousands of them and we will talk about this and also why we still need the host CPU in these lectures and the so-called main bottleneck that we have today in high performance computing, which is basically always more or less going through the main memory. Um, addressing this also with a little bit of an idea of how you can basically in the future prevent this by doing directly message passing between the different GPUs or using the CPU just basically as a kind of, uh, you would say, um, interconnect idea of doing this with different GPUs. Hence, we in high performance computing, of course, limit not ourselves to one GPU. Here, we just rather think about much more higher scale. You see here a very nice plot how we use actually Juvels and Jureka, two supercomputers with more and more nodes. And with this also getting towards, let's say, 24 nodes with each having four GPUs using it all for a problem in remote sensing here, an application problem with 96 GPUs in parallel. These days we already use also 500 GPUs in research. Also, we have advanced to the A100, basically NVIDIA systems and their new systems around that basically have even more performance. And we'll talk a bit about this in the GPU lecture in lecture six. Now, the, the most benefits, and this leads directly to our lecture seven, is essentially of GPUs these days in HPC, the advancements we have in machine learning, 
more particular talking about deep learning. Hence, lecture seven, also as a preparation for what which will follow from Reza in a CFD special, I will provide you with a short introduction to deep learning. So obviously it's not a deep learning course. So there's another deep learning course here at the university that I would recommend taking if you really are interested in this topic that we maybe can, you know, basically motivate a bit this is lecture seven in you. But here we draw the emphasis not directly on the deep learning topic itself, but rather how deep learning can then leverage this GPU power. Having basically lots of matrix vector multiplications, matrix matrix multiplications, which inherently are in almost all deep learning algorithms, um, you basically quickly will understand why basically GPUs are just beautiful for deep learning. And this is a parallel processing philosophy that really fuels the power of deep learning today. Um, in other words, you could say deep learning would be not even possible without HPC. And one of the assignments will actually uh, show you this when you do deep learning algorithms on CPUs. Traditional CPUs, you will see that's unbelievable slow. And if you want to have cutting edge models like transformer models or other models like gated recurrent units or long short term memory that also Razor will motivate and will use later on, then you basically understand that today HPC is really intertwined with machine learning and deep learning needs of really bringing these models really into existence. Hence, we talk a lot about the advantage of HPC for deep learning models. And I think that's all from my part of this HPC uh, that I get bring you on the table. Now I would give over to Reza. And yeah, then with eight, you start over and I give the microphone to Reza now. Hello again, everyone. Uh, just a brief introduction. Maybe the online uh, audience, they didn't hear me. I'm Reza. I'm currently a PhD student working in movies. And my focus uh, on the application of the HPC uh, in uh, fluid dynamics. Uh, let's continue about the lectures. Uh, in lecture eight, uh, as Moise mentioned, uh, in the previous uh, lecture, we will uh, talk about the high performance computing and uh, the architecture of the parallel computing. Uh, then you have the introduction and you have the detail and you have some uh, practical uh, lecture. Uh, then you are ready, as Moritz said, using the science and uh, some engineering application. Uh, in the lecture eight, we will start about the introduction about the CFT. CFT is the computational flight dynamics. Uh, uh, usually, when we talk about the computational flight dynamics, uh, most of the engineer or most of the science think that they are not working in this area. They think it's only related to the fluid or only me mechanical engineering or civil engineering, but actually the uh, competition model, it's very broad area. You have it everywhere in the uh, medical science, uh, in the chemistry, in the research, in the geothermal science, everywhere we are using the fluid because the fluid is everywhere. So uh, if you want to study the fluids, we need to ha have a computational. Uh, this mix of the flight dynamics, it's everywhere. Uh, then this area is give you uh, perspective uh, how you use the uh, high performance computing in this area in every uh, scientific related to the CFD. Uh, in the introduction, we will have a background about the fluid dynamic, how it started. Uh, it's very uh, old method is coming from the time. Uh, and we will have some example from the range of the application. Uh, then we will talk about the Navier stocks and the uh, numerical scheme. Uh, indeed, in this course, we don't want to teach the CFD, as you know. Uh, so we only have introduction and some uh, brief example, uh, some advantage and disadvantage of the CFD, what the obstacle that we have now. Uh, the most important things about the CFD, <clears throat> because it's computational method, uh, so, uh, most of the problem, the real problem, we can say like the aircraft, like the spacecraft, <clears throat> uh, we have a very massive calculation. Uh, so for most of the problem, we can't solve them usually. Uh, 
and uh, we need the high performance computing. And still, with this level of the high performance computing, we can solve many problems. Uh, and we still far from to solve every problem in the universe. Uh, so here, uh, this introduction, uh, giving our uh, perspective about the CFT and what it is, what the problem, how we can use the HPC. Uh, in the second part of this lecture, we will talk about the classification of the flows. Usually we have laminar and turbulent flow, and we will explain uh, them. Uh, then we will talk about the boundary condition, uh, how we can specify the boundary condition in the CFT problem, and uh, especially about the uh, turbulence flow. Uh, it has a specific techniques in the CFT to solve this kind of the problem. It's called the RANS, uh, Reynolds Average Navier Stokes. And LES, it means uh, large edit simulation, and DNS, it means direct numerical simulation. We will talk in detail about that, and you will uh, see some examples. Uh, in lecture nine, we will continue after the introduction we had in the previous lecture, uh, and you had seven lectures about the high performance computing. So here we will see how we can uh, run the computational fluid problem uh, on the uh, high performance computing. We have different topology. We will talk about the topology. Uh, we will have some uh, uh, review on the vector computer, super scalar computers, uh, and then we will see parallel programming, how it's working with the uh, uh, computational problem. Uh, in the CFD, we have two uh, main methods, explicit and implicit method. Usually, implicit present the accurate result but it's massive calculation because in the one equation we have different variables so uh, it's very difficult to solve it and it's taking a long time the computing you run your computer on the laptop usually uh, maybe five years ago six years ago when you run one ANSYS program you stay for three days for it to get run and you see the result and you see ever finally no solution so uh, the HPC helping us to solve this kind of the problem. Um, and uh, this area about the parallel iterative scheme, gradient methods, uh, particle methods, we will talk about them. Uh, in lecture 10, uh, we will talk in the beginning about the mm, deep learning, and we will uh, specify the deep sequence models uh, uh, to uh, explain this uh, application and now we are at the time that you have seen every day artificial intelligence is spreading everywhere and every day we have a new result new idea about the artificial intelligence how we can use it uh, and the capability of the deep learning uh, recently present in many applications in the fluid dynamic in the medical uh, for example still they are using the deep learning to study the COVID spreading, how the COVID is spreading the, and how we can expect in the future what's happening. Uh, in the fluid dynamics, the prediction forecasting for the future is very important. Uh, we can see this area in the weather, for example. We need to predict the weather for the future. We will talk about the example about the wind energy in many countries. For example, the northern countries, we have the wind energy uh, we are using uh, to support the demand. Uh, we can't predict the wind, actually, with the models with the Richardson, for example, they can predict two or three days. Uh, now, many studies trying to using the deep learning uh, to predict the wind for the longer time, for 10 days, because the company of the production of the electricity from the wind, they want to know uh, in the next day how much energy they can produce and uh, they can support the demand on. Uh, so this is the one of the application of the deep learning. We will talk about it and we can have an example. Uh, then we are going to uh, introduce uh, two most uh, important methods in the sequential in the deep learning. We call it long short term memory, LSTM, and gated recurrent units uh, GRU method, how we can use the sequential data to have a prediction. Uh, and uh, recently in uh, 2022, uh, we had uh, used these uh, two methods and we made prediction for a specific turbulence flow. 
uh, this picture you see here is from a publication. Uh, and uh, we made prediction here for this picture, for example, you can see. Oops. Okay. Here, for example, this is the real flow from the experiment. And then we use uh, this GRU and LSTM model to predict the flow. This area is the prediction. And this area is the prediction. And exactly it's matching the real data. It's from the deep learning. To perform this model, you need the HPC because it's training and it's taking many computations. So this is the practical example and we'll uh, talk about it in the lecture. Uh, in lecture 11, we will talk about the open form, open form one open source uh, software uh, using in the CFD. And it has a part as well related to the solid uh, object as well. Uh, we will talk about uh, uh, feature of this software and how we can use it. Uh, and then uh, we will see some example in the laminar and turbulent flow uh, with example. And we will see how we can running uh, the open form in the parallel. Um, uh, and we will expect maybe we'll have invited lecture from the industry. So we will, uh, they will present some application in the industry from the open form. Uh, this is about the software. Uh, um, also, we are trying to using maybe ANSYS. Uh, we're trying to install the module of the ANSYS of the which machine that we are using in the high performance computing. So if we get that one in this lecture, also we'll have a, a, some example from the ANSYS, how we can run it and using the HPC. Uh, in lecture 12, uh, in the CFD, computational dynamic, we have a very strong uh, alternative. Uh, for the traditional CFD, it's lattice Boltzmann. It's very strong method. Uh, the concept is very strong and it's uh, capable to solve maybe every problem. But uh, it, we are in the beginning of the way. Uh, many research ongoing on this method to see how it's work because it's uh, the uh, view of this method. It's uh, microscopic, so we can solve everything from the microscopic view. It seems from the we can start from microscopy and going the bigger problem. Uh, it has a, some uh, benefit with the HPC. It's much easier to use it in the parallel than the traditional CFD because we are focusing only, uh, you see in this picture here, we are focusing only one particle in any direction like vector. So it's very easier to distribute between different machines. Uh, but it's still, uh, Many research on it and many unknown, so they are working on it. Uh, we will talk about this method and the methodology we can use it in uh, the lattice Boltzmann, uh, then how it's possible to uh, define it for the turbulence flow. Uh, and uh, in the end, we will see how we can run it with the parallel computing. Uh, in lecture 13, uh, we will talk about uh, mechanism. It's called attention mechanism. It's very new. Uh, the paper is come from this method they suggested it in 2020. Uh, it's kind of the deep learning with many layers. Uh, and uh, the concept of this with the attention to the main feature, to the dominant feature. With many layers, finally, we will find uh, the main feature. And then we can use that main feature for the prediction. Uh, so uh, we have encoder and decoder architecture on this uh, uh, architecture, and uh, then uh, we can use this method. It's still, uh, there are not too many applications of this. Uh, so we have recently used it for also in the fluid dynamic. Here we made prediction, and so we, in the second part we have a practical presentation of this method, how we can use it, how we can define the model and use it for the prediction, and then how we can validate uh, the result. In the lecture 14, we will jump from fluid dynamic to the solid area, the solid object. Uh, and we will talk about the finite element as well. Uh, the finite element has a three uh, well-known methods, direct method, variational method, and 
weight and diesel method. We will talk about them, how they are working. Some of them uh, has a limitation. We can't use them for every problem. Uh, and sometimes it's very difficult to specify the variation method for the problem. So we will see how they are working and how we can connect them to the parallel computing. Uh, as well, we will talk the meshes in the finite element, how they are working, uh, how we can, because we have different uh, structure of the uh, element you can see in this slide. Uh, we will talk about the interpolation function, features and processing, and we will have an example from the stiffness matrix. Uh, lecture 15, the last lecture in my part, it's, uh, we can say is a state of the art in the field of the HPC. It's uh, quantum computing. Uh, uh, we are, of course, we are not going in detail about quantum computing. Uh, but we will have a review on what the quantum computing and the idea from where came. Uh, the short story is uh, from the Richard Feynman. It's a physics scientist. He was a physics scientist and he suggested studying the quantum in many areas. He started first with the physics and then uh, it's developed to many things. Now we have it in the quantum, uh, quantum computing as well. For example, recently in 2020, uh, his idea is get real. Some uh, researchers, they got it. He said the turbulence flow that is a challenge in the physics. In 2020, some scientists find the solution in the turbulent quantum so that we can solve the problem from the quantum view. And we, can, we will talk about some example, uh, how the quantum working in the quantum mechanics, turbulent quantum, quantum in the physics, and uh, how, uh, what the, uh, vectors in the quantum computing. Uh, so we will see in the quantum computing how they uh, uh, developed to date and uh, we will see its capability. And uh, as well, um, from our partner uh, in the research group, uh, we have uh, experts, they're working, they're running the quantum computing. And if they had time, we will see, invite them as a lecture and you will see some practical uh, lecture from this uh, quantum computing as well. uh, my section is finished for the lecture here if you just I wanna uh, use this opportunity uh, about this course uh, I can say this course with the uh, movie supervising this course is very good opportunity if you are from the different fields high performance computing now it's important in every field it's everywhere we need the high performance computing uh, so maybe some question uh, you have about the project, uh, maybe in the future about your master thesis, or maybe in the future for the PhD. Uh, I can tell you, uh, if you are in any field, you can use the hypervised computing and the perspective for the future. I think uh, it's like when the time was, if you don't know English language, you can't live. So uh, if you don't know high performance computing, you can't do anything in the science or engineering because we are going to solve uh, big problems. And we have the tools. We have the high performance computing and we have now the artificial intelligence. We put them together and we can solve the problem. Uh, about the idea, about the project, of course, many ideas. Uh, if you have ideas, you can uh, feel free to contact me. And if you have suggestion from your job, if, of course you are master, uh, you, are, you are master student, so you are expert uh, in your field. If you have any idea, we can discuss about it. Uh, some of you maybe in the, from the company, you have data, you can work on the processing data from the hyperbolic computing. Uh, maybe you have model or simulation, uh, and of course we have some uh, experiment data. We have measurement data from our research group. If someone interested, you can use it and process the data from the high-performance computing. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, you can have a good result and you can find the way for the master thesis. Uh, we have some data and topic. It's possible to develop for the master thesis. And of course, maybe to the PhD because the data is very massive and it has a many way to do it and uh, get the result. Uh, so this is my suggestion. and. Uh, uh, Professor Morris has uh, access to many uh, universities and experts. Uh, for example, the Junior Supercomputer, we have many experts there. Uh, 
if you uh, contact us, we easily we can contact you to them and you can ask any question. They can help you if you're looking for a specific structure, a specific code. Uh, easily they can help you. They are okay to help you in any kind of the HPC. Uh, I hope you can use this opportunity for your future and enjoy this course. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah, coming to the end of the course today, um, just maybe also what Reza was explaining, we want to try to really incorporate you in much of the practical settings. The epilogue will be all about it. It's basically an informal close of the course that we will do together, thinking about what jobs existing, uh, which international bounds we can bring, right? Not only Germany, I have many friends in the US, um, everywhere in Europe. So, of course, when you have interest in working HPC longer or so, we can get you there and just we'll do in the last part of the course, which is then really April, we're talking about the end of the course, um, where we then just have a different perspective of this kind of course and see more rather through job applications and job offerings, where are the buzzwords that you already learned, many cores, you know, multi-core, deep learning, AI, HPC, MPI, and so on. So from that regard, uh, I hope we will do a very nice course together. I think we have some experience in this over the last eight years, 10 years nowadays. Um, just another in kind of motivational one, uh, which is a little bit of fun, which we would also think is sometimes happening in HPC. It's a field which is, of course, lots of interaction between technologists and scientists. So hence we have also fun along the way. We should mention this also in the HPC workshops that will come. You will notice this. You have seen it's sometimes really dry topics. Understanding not this Boltzmann code is not the easiest. MPI in the beginning is not the easiest, but once you get there and have some interesting fun, there could be also, um, you know, interesting topics coming up. And I think the penguins here um, that you hopefully know, um, know a little bit about this. But of course, because of the YouTube recording, I would just emphasize again the bibliography. I do this also that you really use that, you know, basically try to see and here and there uh, look at least at the points where you have really interest in, right? What you want to learn more a little bit. And of course, needless to say, not only Razor stands about uh, all our achievements or my achievement, there's a whole research group with 15 people now, lots of PhDs that do a lot of elements also in the slides that you see, really practical examples from real uh, problems we solve. And I'm also grateful to them, including Razor also taking here half of the part because we get more and more research projects and are very busy in research as well.